You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Simon Bowmaker of the NYU Stern School of Business. Simon, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thank you, Garrett. Thanks for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to have you. Simon is the author of a new book, When the President Calls, Conversations with Economic Policymakers, which will be our topic for today. Uh, so, Simon, uh, how about you give the uh, the elevator pitch for this book? Uh, it's about, uh, it, it contains interviews you've had with, uh, with economists who have worked under the President of the United States, helped direct policy. What, what's, what's the book about in general, and, and how did you come to... Uh, to write it? So I came to write it by, I've done two books uh, which involved interviewing academics on how they teach economics and how they do research in economics. And the next step would be, you know, to do something on policy, what it's like to be an economist to come to Washington. Um, so the book was all about the last 50 years of policymaking uh, in the White House. And I interviewed 35 policymakers from people back in Nixon administration all the way up to Trump. And it's all about the, the personalities, the, the players, the, uh, the triumphs, the failures of, uh, of what it's like to, to be working under massive pressure with, with high stakes and, um, you know, the massive... Uh, media intrusion that that comes with it all, uh, you know, working with the president, um, getting an ins insight into uh, the different personalities um, of the last, uh, you know, nine presidents, as I say, from Nixon to Trump, including, you know, obviously Obama and Clinton, Bush 41, Bush 43, Ford, Carter, um, Reagan. So it was a lot of fun, a lot of work. It took me seven years to put it together. And uh, I'm glad it's it's actually out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm glad too because I I think uh, you know this this is the kind of kind of thing that has is a treasure trove of useful information. Uh, mm -hmm. I can I, I can so. see uh, <laughs> I can see future historians you know when they're writing about economic policy from the last you know several decades saying ah yes and and you know. And uh, Greenspan would later say in an interview about this time, mm. such and such a th thing, you know, and, and you, I, you know, I mentioned Greenspan, you have a lot of uh, very eminent e economists and policymakers, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Volcker, uh, Art Laffer, Joseph yeah. Stiglitz, Janet Yellen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you, you discovered something that I discovered in the course of making this podcast, which is that very prominent people can be very generous with their time. They can. I was I was very uh, surprised and obviously very happy that uh, so many people were were you know so gracious, so kind and willing to give their time to me. I mean, frankly, I didn't get you know there's only a few people I didn't get in the book who I wanted. The majority of people I contacted, um, I managed to get, and they were very 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 kind, very very gracious, as I say, and uh, were happy to put on record their their experiences of of working for the president and. Uh, I'm eternally grateful. Mm -hmm. So one thing that's really interests me about this topic is just, uh, you know, how uh, if, if I compare economists to lawyers, say, there's, mm. there's a very clear... As, as Stiglitz does all the time in that right. book. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. There's a very clear mechanism, or there, there are many clear mechanisms by which lawyers influence policy. You know, they, they sit on the Supreme Court, they argue before courts. Uh, many politicians are, are lawyers, so they have both formal and informal connections to government. And so if I were, if I were going to, you know, if, if there were a, an idea and it was held by most of the people in the top law schools, I, I, would, I would be willing to bet a lot that, you know, 10, 20 years down the road, that idea would have translated into policy. But economists have a bit of a different relationship with government uh you know there there are a lot of many positions that economists hold in government aren't you know formal positions where you must have a phd in economics to, right. to hold them uh, unlike many <laughs> positions where you need a law degree and if you look at the the places 
you know, a part, uh, you know, you, you can, you can be a businessman and, and, uh, serve on, for, on the fed or, you know, you can, you don't have to be a con- an economist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Hank Paulson's a good example who became, uh, treasury secretary, uh, Bush 43, you know, you've, you've probably read about, uh, Jack Lew in the book. Jack Lew is, is, uh, is a lawyer by training. Uh, Stu Eisenstadt, who's in the book, is a lawyer by training. Jimmy Carter's uh, domestic policy advisor. Um, Stephen Friedman, who was working for Bush 43 as NEC director. Um, another, you know, lawyer by training, working uh, for Goldman Sachs, uh, co-chair. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different backgrounds in the book. Uh, and, you know, it's fair to say that the... They're not all the so-called, you know, the Ivy Tower uh, economists who uh, who go to Washington having spent 20, 30 years in the classroom. These are people who are bringing, you know, experience from the, the corporate boardroom or, you know, working in the, the, the high-fluting uh, law firms. Mm-hmm. And, and they, uh, you know, and uh, they turn that experience, uh, whether in academia or outside of it, uh, into policy recommendations recommendations help helping to steer policy um so just a a really general question to start off with do you think economists and economic advisors have been a net positive for government policy overall get that one out of the way <laughs> yeah look i it's hard for me to take a, a negative uh standpoint to that uh particular mm-hmm. question you know doing all that research over those years you know, and I'm an economist myself. Mm-hmm. I can't possibly say anything other than the fact that uh, I think an economist plays a, an important role uh, in the executive branch. Um, I'm somewhat disappointed that it looks like these days under the Trump administration, they've not been quite cast aside, but they're playing a somewhat reduced role. But certainly, you know, over the the course of that life last uh, half century, they're playing an important role. And uh, in fact, up to Obama, I would say they were you know playing an increasingly important role. Uh, if you think about their their role they played in the economic crisis, uh, you know, Obama's inner circle included some big hitting economists, uh, you know, including of course uh, Larry Summers, and uh, they played a you know huge role in, in, in rescuing the country from uh, the precipice. Mm-hmm. And to the extent that their advice was followed and they were they were there for mm-hmm. guidance, you, you think that uh, uh, things would, would have been worse without them if you replaced Absolutely. every economist with a, a lawyer and uh, didn't have that, that whole field <laughs> of expertise? I'm not going on record saying that, but <laughs> yeah. uh, certainly, yeah, I think the, the, the power of economic thinking and, and uh, the unique skills that you know, special framework that we bring to the table was uh, was of paramount importance uh, during the crisis, and also looking back to you know uh, other problems we've had in the economy over that fifty uh, year period. Mm-hmm. So let's let's talk about the roles that uh, the economists you interview have held in the U.S. government. You mentioned Treasury Secretary, and then of course there's the yep. Fed Chair. Um, there's the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, what, what, what else? Uh, what else is there that? Uh, what other positions do econ- economists commonly hold in government? And yeah, in the book, I I focused on the executive branch. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I interviewed people who had held the role of Fed chair, as you know, uh, Volcker and uh, Greenspan and uh, Yellen. But I was speaking to them about their role. Uh, you know, Yellen and Greenspan as, as chair of the, the Council of Economic Advisors and Volcker about his time at the Treasury. I mean, so you're getting, I, I, get, I guess I did four major places. I did Treasury, uh, Council of Economic Advisors, OMB, and uh, I did the National Economic Council, the NEC. So that was the four main places where I, uh, I focused my interviews. I mean, you could say, look, there's also you know, Department of Commerce, but I re- that was the, the four main places I thought would I'd, I would get the most mileage in terms of uh, the heavyweight economists working in Washington. Mm-hmm. And a book's not infinitely long, so you, you have to focus yeah, somewhere. I, I had to stop somewhere. In fact, I was originally going to do 
the Council of Economic Advisors. That was going to be my my um, the, the main thrust of the book. And then I realized that was just too narrow focused. Um, the council's changed quite a lot over the years. And, you know, I thought, okay, well, what about OMB? What about uh, NEC? Uh, you know, there, there were other branches I wanted to uh, to tap into, but not too many. Where, where do you think economists have been the most influential in government or in the executive branch? Hmm, that's a, that's a tricky question. I mean, I would say an economist, you know, hold, <laughs> holding constant where you actually work. I mean, they, they've become more, you know, pervasive. I think if you look over the last 50 years, economists in Washington have become more pervasive, but they're essentially playing the same role. And that's, essentially, you know, it's wherever you're working, um, you're, you're bringing this unique framework, uh, this, this core set of tools, uh, this, you know, high standard of evidence to data, you're bringing that to the table. I think wherever you work in, in DC as, as an economist, um, you're trying to ferret, ferret out those, those bad ideas, which, um, you may have read in the book seem to sort of permeate DC from other agencies that brought down, and the economists try and kill those bad ideas. So I think, as I say, wherever you're working as an economist, um, it's I'm sure it's true you have more influence in certain areas compared to others. But ultimately, you know, you you're playing. You know, the economist has the, sole, the same uh, toolbox that they 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 bring to the table. Mm-hmm. I, and I think uh, I think there there are some issues that economists have uh, ideas about, but that everyone else does too. So I, I wouldn't expect, you know, economists to have a lot of uh, influence over on the, like the general level of taxation in the you know whole economy. That's mm-hmm. something that, uh, you know, that is determined through, through, you know, many elections and, and bargains between right. politicians over the course of, you know, centuries, you know, mm-hmm. but they can bring to the table, you know, the, the evidence on, you know, what happens, you know, at the margin when you change somebody's tax rate, um, they can bring all of that evidence to the uh, uh, to those meetings about what what the literature, what the research is telling you about the impact of ta- taxation. You know, uh, thinking about you know elasticities, etc., and incentive effects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you know, do you do you tax uh, capital gains at the same rate as as regular income? That's something that maybe uh, mm. most people don't have a strong opinion about. They don't uh, maybe right. un- understand the difference uh, too well, and it's mm-hmm. not a not an incredibly common topic of political debate. But I, I, I kind of think that yeah. economists are likely to have the most influence on, on policies that are just so esoteric that only economists mm-hmm. have an opinion on them so uh your Mm. average person um has no idea what the uh you know the fed funds rate is on a day-to-day basis or 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 any opinion on what it should be so that's that's an area where they're going to turn people are going to turn to the economist and say hey what what should this number be right i think uh so you know as well we, we go back to uh James uh, James Tobin, the the great uh, Nobel laureate economist from Yale, who who said, you know, the whole point of economics was to uh, deal with crises. So obviously, in the in, in the book, you know, I interviewed a lot of people who were during their time in D.C. working for the president. <clears throat> they were they were dealing with those incredible crises, whether it was the financial crisis or you know uh, what was happening in the 1970s, uh, in particular with you know uh, dramatic you know, high rates of inflation, et cetera. Um, and again, it's that idea of, you know, those bad ideas uh, being ferreted out by the economists. I think that's a, a role which uh, the, the, the general pe- public uh, don't realize economists play when they're in D.C. There are these horrendously bad ideas come to the table. And uh, thankfully, we, we tend not to actually hear about them. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to talk about some of those specific bad ideas. If, if, uh, <laughs> if economists just, um, if all we ever did, uh, you know, if the only real world effect we ever had was to just take the the ten percent worst ideas off the table, that would more than pay for all of our salaries in perpetuity. Right. 
Yeah, I think it was it was Janet Yellen who said to me, you know, it was like it's it's hard to think of these things as a positive, but they are actually a positive if um, you're preventing something from uh, from actually happening. Yeah, uh, whether it's you know uh, offering insurance on four uh, one k plans if the stock market is it's going to go down, which it is today, as you well know. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, we're recording this offering... on March 9th, twenty twenty, by the way, for <laughs> listeners. Uh, and uh, yeah, 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 the stock market just uh, just nosedived, tanked again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or whether it's offering in the financial crisis, you know, uh, uh, home price insurance. So if the that you know the the price of your house goes down, uh, the government would step in and uh, kind of bail you out. Uh, so some of the, those ideas were actually mooted during uh, various administrations. Yeah, yeah. I, if I if I recall the uh, have, have those come up again and again. I, I heard about the uh, the home price insurance during the the Bush uh, George W. Bush administration. Yeah. So it's uh, Austin Goldsby telling me about the home price insurance, and then it was Glenn Hubbard. Bush 41, uh, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, tell me about the, you know, the 401k plans being guaranteed if the, the stock market uh, crashed, which is, uh, you and I both know as, a, as economists, that's a, a really, really bad idea. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's, uh, I mean, let's go into some some detail. Uh, so if the entire stock market crashed and then the U.S. government uh, had a pledge to uh, compensate every single person who had invested in it, uh, or every si- single U.S. citizen, or, or you know, U.S. person who had invested in it. You know, um, so well, I think anyone can see that that would be extremely costly and and just m- might not be something they could um, they could actually do. But uh, but let's talk talk a little about the bad incentives that that creates. Yeah, well, it, it's you know, for one thing, we're we're thinking about here, you know, trying to. You know, uh, you're encouraging uh, certain behaviors which you you clearly don't want to encourage. Uh, you and I both know. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, I mean, you know, when we think about moral hazard, uh, what would be the moral hazard there in that particular case? Where I'm saying to you right now, okay, so if the stock market goes down, uh, we're going to guarantee those 401k plans for you. So as you know, with moral hazard. That's going to uh, encourage, you know, risky, speculative behavior. And if the stock market doesn't indeed go down, it would be, as, as you say, extremely costly for the uh, for the government. Yeah. Nor- normally, when I invest, there's a <laughs> trade off between uh, risk and uh, mm. and and payoff. And so, you know, if I if I want a really high return, then I need to accept that I might lose everything by taking risky yeah. bets. Uh, if the government right. stands to uh, to back me up in the case where to I take bail me these risks, yeah, th- then yeah. Uh, then I only take the risky bets. So why, why would I ever uh, buy bonds? Why would I ever invest in a you know safe blue chip stock mm-hmm. when I could just gamble on on the riskiest possible things all the time? I, I'm yeah. I the systemic effects Sorry, of that I mean, would be that's, huge, that's but all one bad. Of- <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's classic uh, Econ 101 with, uh, you know, thinking about asymmetric information and thinking about uh, moral hazard. Absolutely. Yeah, I think personally, as you know, if I if I were an investor in that scenario, I would be betting on on them uh, realizing the, the that they can't possibly uh, afford to mm. uh, afford to stand on this policy. And uh, and I would probably try to invest just like I normally would would assuming mm-hmm. that the policy would completely collapse but uh yeah, yeah who who know who knows what uh would um would be would be a very strange world and and I'm I'm glad there were some yeah. economists in the room to say eh, don't do that <laughs> yeah uh, there were, there were some things that you know came through which uh unfortunately there wasn't enough time to stop them i think that the one that comes to mind was uh Gerald Ford's win uh program you may recall from the like uh, seventy four, seventy five, uh, where they were sending out these buttons to uh, you know whip inflation now, which was essentially voluntary, uh, and trying to encourage people uh, to uh, to cut back on their spending, and uh, that was something which uh, Alan Greenspan was saying was a you know a terrible, terrible idea. But it unfortunately uh, it got out of the bad bag, and uh, it actually was was put in place. So they they weren't okay. So I I actually wasn't uh, 
familiar with this, but they they weren't <laughs> um, trying to push businesses to keep their prices lower, which is not a great idea for different reasons. But they were encouraging mm. consumers to not spend. Yeah, it was a it was a form of you know it was it was essentially a gimmick. Um, you know, uh, Gerald Ford was was telling the nation that uh, you know any chance you could uh, cut back on how much you're uh, consuming in a given week, uh, how much food you consume. I'm sure you can spare, you know, a few cents. And everyone was supposed to be wand- wandering around with these uh, win badges, which you can still buy on uh, eBay, these these old ones. Um, so it was a gimmick which really wasn't uh, very successful. But it was one which uh, Alan Greenspan was certainly uh, heavily against, but it uh, unfortunately it, it went through. Right, right. So, and uh, at at that time, um, Alan Greenspan, uh, where he was he was uh, not yet Fed chair. He was chair of the council. He'd just council, come in. Right. Um, he'd literally walk through the door while they they were uh, they were sending out these uh, these buttons for people to wear in the street, uh, and it was essentially too late for him to uh, to have too much influence. I mean, he. He had a very, very close relationship with Ford. Uh, he was probably more influential uh, in terms of having the president's ear relative to the median uh, council chair, but that's something which uh, even he couldn't uh, actually stop. Yeah, and 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 uh, the Council of Economic Advisors um, give give me a give me a rundown of what they do. So they they don't have any formal policy making role you know they they don't have to sign off on a policy uh for it to be passed they more or less just advise the president yeah so as the uh the name suggests they they play an advisory role um they don't have an operational role um for example i spoke with uh uh, john taylor the professor at uh, stanford professor of economics uh many people will know him from the uh the taylor rule Mm -hmm. and he was actually offered the job as, as uh, council chair under Bush uh, 43, but at the same time, he was also offered the position as uh, under secretary of the treasury uh, for international affairs. And he told me he took the latter because it was more of an operational role, getting his hands dirty, whereas, you know, being the chair of the council, which is still a very prestigious position, uh, was more of an advisory role. So they're doing... Uh, it's actually quite a small unit. Um, I think it's roughly sort of 30 to 40 staff these days. Um, it's There's a chair. There are two members. Uh, the rest of them are sort of senior economists and uh, research assistants. The senior economists tend to be academics taking like a couple of years worth of leave uh, from their universities. Um, they produce... You know, most of the empirical economic research for the for the White House, well, quite a lot of it at least, and uh, they, uh, you know, they, they produce this thing called the Economic Report of the President, which you may have seen. Mm-hmm. So they, I mean, the, you know, the, the power and influence of the of the council has sort of waxed and waned over the years, you would say. It, it depends upon the administration, how powerful that unit actually is. Right. And and the, the president uh, himself, if... if uh... So so far, uh, I, I was going to say themselves, but at this point, we have not had any any women presidents. But um, but uh, you know, if they if they choose to uh, to read what the the Council of Economic Advisors sends them, if they they choose to heed that advice, uh, and um, one one thing you talk about in the book is how different presidents uh, have different relationships with uh, with uh, the economists who work under them. Yeah, absolutely. As I, as I say, so Obama, I mean, he gave the council chair uh, cabinet level status, which was a big deal. And as I said to you earlier, the, during the financial crisis, the, the, the Council of Economic Advisors was playing a, a significant role. You know, we had uh, some, you know, very, very uh, well-known and uh, outstanding economists who were, who were in, the, uh, in that seat. I mean, we had Christy Romer. Uh, Alan Kruger, Jason Furman, uh, Austin Goolsby. And uh, then, you know, President Trump, you know, he came along and uh, one of the first things he did was to uh, take away that, that uh, cabinet level status from the, from the council. 
So it, it's 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 playing very much a a reduced role in in uh, 2020 right now. Yeah, I do, is do you have any idea why Trump would have done that? Uh, you know, it's I a, do. Okay, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be careful what I say. I mean, for me, it All would right. be the views of economists are simply not convenient to. Uh, Donald Trump right now. Mm-hmm. So, the, you know, the typical economist, their views on uh, in particular trade, uh, their views on, for example, immigration. Uh, I think, as I say, on the trade side, I just don't think he would like to hear certain things which are not in line with his, with, with his own views. So they were kind of pushed aside somewhat when he came to power. Yeah. Which is a disappointment to me. <laughs> yeah, it... Uh... It's uh, it's kind, of, it's a shame, and um, uh, yeah, I, I think a, a lot of people, um, I guess among among activists, you know, there there's kind of a, a view of economists as being these sort of uh, you know, right wing people because uh, you know, because of the views on on maybe markets or or um, or just uh, like uh, markets in general, and maybe maybe a slightly more negative uh, view of 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 regulation of, uh, any kind of, of most price controls. Um, but, uh, but yeah, on, on, you know, the, if, if you had just a simple sort of right left model of politics and okay, Trump's right. And economists are vaguely right. So he should, he should totally agree with them. But on, on these, on his main issues on trade and immigration, you know, the economists are, are very much, you know, there's almost a consensus in favor of, uh, of basically free trade and uh, liberalized migration, and that that really does not fit with the current administration. Yeah, I mean, I I spoke uh, to Kevin Hassett, who was uh, Trump's first council chair, and uh, very very nice guy, and you know couldn't be more uh, friendly towards me. And I did try and ask him those questions. Essentially, <laughs> the the question you asked me there, and um, you know, understandably, he was still. Uh, sitting in that position, so uh, I couldn't quite manage to uh, to get an answer, <laughs> which was the one I, I I thought I might get in the end. But uh, yeah, he he had a role to uh, try and protect that, so I understand. Right. That that's a that's a very common pattern that when when these uh, when people work in government, uh, you don't hear a lot of sort of. Um, unguarded talk from them until they leave uh, so so for all the past administrations you get clearer answers yeah i mean to be fair i you know i, I sound like i'm name dropping here but uh <laughs> i i was delighted to speak to uh hank paulson and i spoke to him and he said look you have no chance of getting anyone from trump to uh speak to you uh it's just not going to happen there's no one in you know sitting in those roles right now who'll say a word to you so I got two people. I, I got uh, I got Kevin Hassett, uh, council chair, as I say, first person, and then I, I got uh, Mick Mulvaney, uh, who was the uh, OMB director for Trump. So that was um, uh, yeah, that was quite a nice surprise. And uh, I'd, I'd say Mulvaney was was quite uh, was quite effusive, and uh, in many ways he actually didn't hold back, which which was the one that surprised me. But uh, you know, Kevin Kevin Hassett. Uh, I, I think was a bit more, a little bit more guarded, mm-hmm. and he is an economist, as you know. I mean, he's a, a you know a PhD trained economist, so yeah. I couldn't really get to those those ideas about trade and immigration uh, as I was hoping to be able to do. So you you mentioned at the at the top uh, that you wrote books about um, you know economists in academia and doing research teaching. Um, but one one thing that uh, comes up in your book is just that just what a disconnect there is from academia to uh, policy and even even the Council of Economic Advisors, which being more advisory, maybe you don't you don't have to know as much about the ins and outs of of working in policy, but it's still a big transition. Do you want to talk a little about about that learning curve for economists entering the <laughs> policy world? Yeah, there's a very, very steep learning curve that that came uh, came you know through in the book very, very clearly indeed. Um, I think you know one of the big things is in in academia it's it's largely a kind of lonely 
solitary pursuit. <laughs> um, it is true that in academia, people write papers together and they, they meet up at conferences and they give seminars. But by and large, I think the, the idea is, you know, people, uh, you know, hunker down in, in their offices every day and they're, they're working very hard. They're, they're uh, you know, 9, 10, 12 hours a day looking at a screen doing their research. Uh, and they have a lot of time to do the research. Uh, you know, okay, I know there are trade-offs with teaching, administration, et cetera, but time you can do a paper, produce a piece of economic research, you know, sort of 12, 18 months, two years, whatever it is. Whereas when you go to D.C., you know, a lot of the economists, the academics who I spoke to were so, you know, you have to give them an answer within 48 hours. Um, the time constraints are incredible. Um, they're under a lot more pressure uh, than uh, than they are in academia in that respect. And also something which Austin Goolsby said to me, which I, I thought was quite interesting, is in academia, you're not used to building what he called uh, coalitions. So trying to, you know, get people on your side, for example, to try and, uh, you know, agree with the way you're going on a particular point or a particular point of view. Um, again, in academia, you're kind of doing your own thing. You're in your office, Okay, people may agree, you know, disagree with you, but generally it's a collegial atmosphere, most places at least. Uh, in D.C., there can be obviously quite a lot of infighting. Um, it's very fraught, lots of, you know, big personalities, um, people who are going to disagree with you. You're going to make a mistake. You don't have time to correct that, you know, in the next revise and resubmit for next year. So it's, it's a very, very different environment indeed. Yeah, I, uh, that uh, 48 hours uh, turnaround mm. is giving me chills because I, I don't think I've ever, you know, uh, sat, and da- sat down and, and done a, an a analysis or written some code that didn't have errors on the first pass. So, so you know, you gotta got to be uh, debugging real quick, uh, uh, you know. It, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, again, it was, it was Austin, Austin Goldsby who said, you know, in... in uh, in uh, academia, if you if you point out a mistake on someone's paper, you know you're you're a hero and they thank you forever. But if you do that in DC, they they say you're a jerk. <laughs> oh, that's what he said to me. Yeah, uh, you know you don't. Do it. It's very, it's a very different environment. Yeah, yeah, because it's uh, you know you're trying to you have some kind of outside goal besides just having the the best paper you can at the end of however many years it takes to uh, to get published in a top journal um you know from from first inception to being published not just the the turnaround time for the uh for the paper so uh, you know you a lot a lot of this book um focuses on the the sort of uh the ins and outs of policy and and uh specific policies and administrations but i noticed you you start a lot of the interviews with um with some some sort of lighter things some personal details about the um about the people you're interviewing, for instance, uh, uh, I didn't know that Alan Greenspan, uh, you know, <laughs> prior to being uh, an economist, was a musician. Um, That's right. Yeah, were there were there uh, were there uh, any of those sort of like fun uh, fun details that jump out at you? Yeah, I think the f- the first question I usually ask people is, "Why did you become an economist?" Is that the one you're looking at? Yeah. yeah. Um. So apart from <laughs> Greenspan being a Musician and uh, way back. Uh, who have we got here? Um, you want me to give me some names? Let's see whether I can recall some of these uh, yeah. these backgrounds. Someone like uh, I don't know Art Laffer. That was one of the best interviews I've I ever did. That was that was quite an experience because I actually learned <laughs> learned a lot about him because he's the one person who he invited me to uh, his house. To meet his family, I had dinner with his family. I stayed at his his house overnight. He was he couldn't have been uh, more friendly if he tried. It was an absolutely amazing experience. Uh, I got to learn uh, everything about him, even over the course of a couple of days. It was it was quite a quite an experience. Nice, yeah. <laughs> and not, not a lot of uh, economists uh, famous for something they they wrote on a napkin once, but uh, but he also That's right. also played it. A pretty big role in in policy as well, and uh, is an interesting guy. Just a bit, <laughs> yeah. just a bit. Yeah, that was a pretty, you know, that was an expansive interview. I think it's fair to say, you know, he uh, 
he has very strong views about uh you know how he's been uh perceived over the years and how the the Laffer curve has been received as uh as as a piece of uh as a piece of work and uh yeah that was a no hold barred you know uh, interview for sure <laughs> I uh, didn't hold back at all. That's that's that was a big takeaway. Yeah, yeah, and I, that's definitely one of the interviews that uh, you have to read. And if you don't uh, get something out of that one, then I I, I concede uh, defeat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh, if um, yeah, there are quite a quite a few economists interviewed in this book. Uh, Thirty thirty five, I think. Um, Thirty five. Yeah, yeah. I had to stop. I, it was getting. Uh, <laughs> I think originally I was planning something like, you know, 20 to 25. My f- my last two books, you know, the teaching one was 21 economists. The research one was 25. So 35 is really pushing pushing things as far as I could go because otherwise the book becomes uh, a little too long. So Yeah. <laughs> and and you know, it uh if if there's just one economist uh listeners are really interested in, you know, if they just just really want to know more about uh Art Laffer or or um, Lawrence Summers or, or uh, I, I mean uh, Alan Greenspan, of course. You know, then you know it's it's probably worth worthwhile to you know gra- grab the book just for just for that one, and you know may- maybe read the others as well. But uh, yeah, the the you know the advantage of the book is you don't have to read it cover to cover. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that. <laughs> I would love you to do that from start to finish, but it's it's designed to you know to be dipped into. You don't have to get into all of the technical detail. There's enough of the personalities uh, in that book. You can just uh, pick an interview or a couple of interviews and read them and then maybe dip into others later. Um, as I say, it's not not a cover-to-cover kind of book. I, I like that because uh, I, I don't always have time <laughs> to, to sit and read an entire book start to, to finish, but I, I do like to be able to get something out of them. Although I, I should say, I've, I you know, I have friends and... Uh, who have uh, who read it cover to cover, and they've actually been emailing me every time they've uh, they've got to a new interview. But um, most people, I think, you're dipping into it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, a little bit of a, a fun question before we uh, finish. Alan Greenspan started as a professional musician before becoming Fed chair. Are there any currently working professional musicians who you'd like to see chair the Fed? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Who would be chair of the Fed as a working professional musician? Um, <laughs> who would I like? Well, my favorite musician is a jazz guitarist called Pat Metheny. Do you know who that is? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that I... might be a good reason for him to be uh, Fed chair, actually. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't want someone too too famous to... <laughs> yeah, he would be my, my pick you know, just because I, he, he's... Uh, my favorite musician of all time, actually. But uh, uh, you probably want someone with very sort of powerful personality. I think maybe someone like uh, Bruce uh, Springsteen, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Too. What do you think of that? He has strong uh, political views. He'd have to try and uh, distance himself from the from the politics when he's doing his uh, economics. But uh, maybe the boss. Yeah. Maybe the boss becomes the boss of the Fed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Before we before we finish, uh, do you have any closing thoughts? Any uh, sort of broad takeaways that you'd like someone who has listened to this whole conversation to uh, come away with? Well, I hope uh, <laughs> it would be nice to to think that uh, you would enjoy the book and you would realize that economics doesn't have to be this dry technical subject it can be used uh very powerfully by you know in in working for the president of the united states um economists do have a role to play i think it's a very influential and a a very important role and uh i hope in the future economists are going to make a a comeback because as i said to you earlier they they've been cast aside somewhat and that's a a big uh a big blow to me but i i just don't think that the power of economic thinking is going to go and you know go away anytime soon, and uh, I hope that comes out in the book from the, uh, the interviews that I did. All right, uh, that concludes the interview. Well, thank you for yeah. having me on the show. Yeah, thank you very much.
I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Simon Bowmaker. I'm Garrett Peterson, and I'm the host of the Economics Detective podcast. You can communicate with me through Twitter, where I'm at Garrett Peterson, or on Facebook in the Economics Detective Facebook group. If you want to have an opinion about which currently working professional musician you'd like to see as Fed chair, we'll be discussing it in that Facebook group. So feel free to join. That's Economics Detective on Facebook and have a discussion. You can also support the show on Patreon, where you can make a small recurring donation for each episode I release. Thank you to everyone who currently does that, and thank you to everyone who listens. I'll be back soon with a new episode.